Hello. I hate Facebook. It's so stressful. You know, they say, do you want to, do you want to, Facebook says, do you want to have a test broadcast? And I say, well, I, I don't know. Do I? I uh, uh. And then, anyway, hello. Good evening. Nice to, um, to see anybody that's going to be joining me. And um, I, uh, I, uh, I hope you are um, sitting comfortably. Um, I wanted to go over some of the questions that I've been uh, getting sent in. And uh, there's some really, really interesting things to talk about. And there's a bit of a thread that runs through them. So uh, I wanted to just, I uh, was looking for a, um, something to print off actually. Um, and um, my um, internet server has changed. So I've had to reset all my printers printing settings but anyway um, so um, uh, what I want to talk about this evening is is uh, unless anybody's got any specific questions um, in which case please by all means throw them across I'm gonna see if I can find the um, uh, the question things here interactivity there's my questions here so there should be a, um, a question box for you that you can that you can see there so um, the thing, for, for those of you that know me, the th the, for those of you who know what, what I do, the thing that I've been doing for the last, oh gosh, what, 30 years um, plus, I would say 30 years, but I think it's a bit longer than that, is putting my hands on people and fiddling around with them to work out why they hurt and how they hurt and what, 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 the, what the reasons are and, and looking at the way they hang together. And what I've always found is that, you know, anatomy, the, 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 the concept of the word anatomy has very little to do with the body as it lives and breathes it has a lot to do with the names of the body and the bits of the body but in terms of how it then fits into us as moving people and human people and all that kind of stuff it, it really doesn't have um uh, much much sort of helpfulness as it were so um my thing and that's when i started out studying anatomy and looking at it was you know i i would see things and i think well actually what what's what's the thing i'm touching what what am i looking at what does it feel like and um, it didn't. It didn't really make a lot of sense. And you go to the book, and you, and then I thought, well, I'm I'm starting to make stuff up as I go along. And who am I to 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 do that when you know the anatomists have been around for hundreds of years, and that they that they know better than me. Anyway, so um, after a while, of course, you sort of have to throw the baby out with the bathwater and 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 make it up as you go along. Hello, hello, Fiona. Hello. Oh, there we go. I can see everybody there now. Hello, Jamie. Hello, um, various people down in the in the comments section. So. Uh, you're very, very welcome to to be along here. So, um, and uh, and um, please throw in any questions that you have into here, and I'll and I'll try and get to them. If I look at this page, because I've got a camera over here, here, and I've got a page over there. Anyway, so where where we've got to? Let me just grab this uh, document and uh, and put this across over here onto this screen. So where I've got to is um, I sort of um, condensed a few things down into sort of some some main questions. And the thing that keeps coming up from people is how do we, and it's the same sort of um, problem that I had, how do we um, bring back and link back anatomy into the work that we do and the practice that we're doing and, and make it uh, meaningful and relevant? So I've got a few comments and a few questions that have come in um, from me putting out um, uh, sort of a, a plea to you to, to tell, and tell me what's going on. Um, so. The, 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 the question that a massage therapist from California has asked is said, is why? You know, the thing you struggle with, why? Um, there's, whole, there's wholeness in a body uh, rather than separated, which is, you know, the meaning of anatomy. Anna and Tomi means to cut up. And um, so, um, hang on, I'm not sure I like this. I find, <laughs> I find the information you give spot on, even your smart ass while you deliver it. What? Me? Smart ass? It's important to know. Um, the question is, is, is why? And similarly, again, with, with layers of tissues, um, and this is something that keeps coming up, um, and um, there is um, quite a lot of um, confusion about layers. This is a, a, a big thing that happens about layers. And um, so the first thing I wanted to say, and it, it's one of those things that, that's really interesting, is that I, I know it's easy to say that, but there aren't any layers in a body and and this has been the problem that we've had and this is the problem that i had when i started out doing dissection you know we take skin off and then we talk about the skin and the, the circles that are underneath uh the the skin and, and of course it doesn't really work like that and then we look at superficial fascia and fat and then deep fascia and so we have all these names and labels for things like deep fascia superficial fascia and actually um you know it dawned on me relatively recently that the the things that we saw as the circles on the skin aren't circles at all what they are is the 
the tissues, if you imagine that these are the, the fibers and this is the skin, and actually as we sever this relationship between here and here, then what we do is we leave behind the, you know, imagine a load of ropes attached to a carpet, and as you cut them, you leave behind those, uh, those bits of section behind, and that's what you're looking at as far as the circles. And the same thing goes when you get down to the, through the superficial fashion, you look at this, this filmy layer, you know, Gil calls it the perifascia and, you know, obsesses about this filmy fascia, perifascia. Well, well, it's not there. You know, again, you've got this connection that's going through the superficial fascia. And once you've cut that away, you just leave a sort of a, a, a filmy, snotty covering across the, the surface of the deep fascia. And it's just a remnant of what has been cut away. It's not there in life. And so it doesn't have any qualities that you can consider individually or, or even spend any time on. It doesn't, doesn't um, you know, doesn't, doesn't mean anything. But the, 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 if you want to understand the idea of layers and you un understand what, what's separating them, if we do dissection, then you feel a change. If I close my eyes and I feel a change in texture and you do the same when you're palpating, what you're feeling is you're feeling uh, a difference between one compartment which is in completely joined on another. And the thing that creates that compartment is not a connective tissue. Um, it's a, a tissue which is one of the four basic um, um, sort of tissues of human mammalian tissues. So we've got um, uh, skeletal, you know, uh, nervous system, nervous tissue, skeletal tissue, and so on and so forth. And this is epithelial tissue. And so the epithelial cells have loads and loads of arrangements um, in them, and they're sort of squamous cells and columnar cells and flat cells. Um, and um, some of them are very, very cheap and they're easy to make, like the, the, the epithelial cells that are in your mouth. You know, you kill 20 million every time you brush your teeth. Um, and then there's others that are a little bit more arranged. But the thing about epithelium is they create all these compartments and all these spaces and they separate out all the organs. Um, and, and you need order. You know, you can't have your kidney floating around where, you know, where your tonsils are. It doesn't, it's not going to work. Um, if you imagine a, a whole school where children from the age of five to uh, 18 go, you know, you can't have them all using the gym and the cafeteria at the same time, be mayhem. So you have to have this organization, this separation. And um, it's this organization, organization separation that is coming from epithelial cells. And the epithelial cells um, don't have any blood supply to themselves. So that means that they take their nutrients from other connective tissues around them and that they have different um, different jobs and different uh, roles to play according to where they are in the body and they get nutrients differently as well. So they're sort of couch surfing <laughs> between the connective tissues and in the connective tissues to create these separation um, and, uh, and um, an organization. Now the fibers that hold the, the superficial fascia, you know every time you pick your skin up you've got superficial skin and superficial fascia and those fibers that hold that adipose in place are blending down through and into the deep fascia. They just change direction and change their nature. So there isn't a single thing that we can call fascia as such. Um, and there isn't a single thing that you could then say, right, okay, um, this is one type of fascia, this is another type of fascia. Because you've got different types of uh, connective tissue, you know, regulate, uh, dense regular, dense irregular, adipose, all in the same place. So there's going to be overlaps of those different types of fascia. So you can't ever say, right, I am feeling one type of fascia and I am doing a release on that type of fascia and therefore this is going to happen. It, you know, it, it's biologically implausible. So um, the, the translating anatomy into your body work or your movement is a bad idea. I mean, I'm going to say it again, translating or trying to translate your anatomy into um, your practice of movement or manual therapy is a bad idea and, and really if you're doing that then stop it. Um, and the reason being is because the nature of anatomy is to name an individual structure. So if you look at a bit of the body and you go right, immediately going to your anatomy says um, here is the deltoid, here is the pectoral and you start to think in that, you are narrowing down into a localized area of, uh, of the body and at the same time, you're completely forgetting and eliminating all the things that are running through it and around it and on it and under it, um, and that, that therefore might have a relationship to it. So, so once you go anatomy, you're, you're, you're trying to remember names of things and trying to assign them to the area that you're looking at. And that, that 
can be useful. It's, it's a good reference point to have, but if you're looking at it from a, th a therapeutic perspective or a movement perspective or a training perspective, um, then it, it's going to basically shut out all those other things that, that might be in your head. It's going to close down intuitive processes and your ability to go, right, well, what is going on here? Um, it's a little bit like trying to <laughs> go, going down to the supermarket. I want you to just go down the supermarket and get um, some bread, some eggs, some milk, and a packet of tights for, for whoever is going to rob the bank tomorrow. And and they're they're abstract enough that you go right. Some bread, some eggs, and milk. Bread, eggs, and milk. I should could probably remember those. It's the tights that are going to throw everything off because they've got to go to a completely different part of the store to get that. Um, and so now suddenly you're focused in wherever the tights are and the right colour. I don't know why I pick, picked on tights. It just you know, it was just as, as far away from eggs and bread and milk as I could get. Um, but you're in that store and now you're in the clothing section. Then you've got to go back to the bakery section and then there's a two for one there. And, and you, in the process, you've gone through a whole load of doors. You, you climbed you out the front door, closed that behind you, you know, got in the car, closed that behind you, got out the gun, so on and so forth. And as you've done that, you've changed the spaces that you have. You've decompartmentalized yourself from where you were trying to remember things. And the same thing goes for anatomy. So try and, and, and avoid, where possible, thinking about anatomy. And instead, take a step back and go, how does this move and how does this move in combination with something else? So you can't move one thing without something else moving. And I'm not talking about just um, agonist and antagonist movement. You know, we're not talking about sort of um, lateral and contralateral or whatever it might be. I'm talking about actual the physics of moving my shoulder. It's not just about the muscles in my shoulder. It's about how do I transfer that load through my hips and through my knees and through my ankles. And anatomy does this really, really badly. You know, medicine does this really badly. We don't have that relationship. We don't have that thing that says, you know, your head weighs 10 pounds. So therefore, the position that you might um, hold it in is, 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 is different to... Um, um, if you hold it in a different position, you're going to load the body differently and therefore have more potential injury through more, a more loaded part or slower recovery. So these are all these issues that we have. And, and so anatomy as, as such um, is, is a poor way of doing anything except passing an exam or learning some names. So um, and once you get into the dissection, then you, you, know, you can start to see this. You can start to follow. You know, if, if, if you didn't know that certain structures ended at a certain point, you, you, you wouldn't do them. You know, you'd be able to follow all the muscles of the leg pretty much all the way down from the top to the bottom, from the pelvis and the hips um, downwards. You know, there's quite often there's not a, a natural stoppage to where those muscles go. So um, uh, this is this is the the idea on the on the, um, the the layers and key points to be able to use the layers. The moment you move one area, everything goes with it. So if, imagine that you know there's a chunk of there's a chunk of tissue. Right, I cut your arm in half, and um, I, I wouldn't do that. But cut your arm in half, and I'm looking down that. Now the moment I move this, I move the skin, I move the superficial fascia and the muscle, and the, everything goes with it. So everything slides through it and in it and around it, and it rotates through down onto the bone. It's all pinned from bone back up to the surface of the skin. That's it. It's complete and it's continuous. And each one of those sections that run through it are going to be doing um, a, a job and holding it down. So it's going through it and around it and on it and under it. Um, and it brings me to a, a new system of anatomy, of learning anatomy that I've developed, which I've called TUI, T-O-U uh, and I, T-O-U-I. And I'm going to write it up a bit more. I say that. I'm never going to write these things up. But TUI stands for through, over, under, and in. So the moment you think of a, of a bit of anatomy, the moment you go deltoid, right, instead of just going deltoid and thinking of its function, think, okay, what goes through the deltoid? Uh, I don't know if you saw my video on, um, on uh, YouTube last week about levator scapula. And so, you know, what's going under levator? What's going through levator scapula? What's going through it in terms of whether it be nerve, whether it be uh, deeper fascia, whether it be muscle bone? What's going, what's over it? You know, what's over or on it? Um, or as the O, oh, what's, what's through it, what's over or on it, what's on top of it? So the layers of other muscle, uh, superficial fascia. What's under it? What goes under levator scapula? Interesting things, you know, serratus posterior and anterior um, all run underneath levator scapula. So uh, that's kind of cool. And then you've got the tissues up around the neck. Um, and then what's in it? What's actually in that tissue in terms of uh, what might be 
um, embedded, say, you know, and there's going to be overlaps, of course. We know what's in this in terms of um, what's in, uh, as far as bone is concerned, or connective tissue, uh, other connective tissues. Um, so, so that's really where I wanted to get at, as far as the layers are concerned. How much can we palpate through those layers? Um, and it's a very interesting question. I think the answer is probably much, much less than we think. Now, a lot is going to depend on, you know, if I, if I bring a skinny 16-year-old in here and I, I sort of uh, palpate them with uh, their nice, clear, t clear tone and their sickeningly young skin, then, uh, <laughs> you know, you can probably feel more than, than if I was going to, you know, palpate me or, or somebody that's a bit older and softer and fatter. Um, so... Um, what you're feeling is a suggestion, is an echo of the tissue that's underneath it, but you are not feeling that individual structure under any circumstances. So people will go, I'm pressing onto this abdomen and I'm feeling the psoas. You are not feeling the psoas. You are feeling dozens of other structures that are through, over, under, um, on and in it. Um, and there's a whole bunch of stuff way, way, way in front of your hands before you get to the psoas. So the focus on that muscle tells you before you go any further that probably you, you've missed 90% of what it is that you are uh, in the region of and a, a whole bunch of that stuff is going to have um, an effect on what it is you, you know, you're trying to do. So when you get a result because you've done that thing on the psoas, I'm going to guarantee you that it's not the psoas that's given you that result. It's the thing that is uh, the combination of all those other tissues that are around it. And I'm just using the psoas as an example. Um, because you know, I would suggest that you don't do it. Um, I, I think um, the the other um, comment was that somebody had, uh, as Pilates teacher said, they struggle with clients who want to have all the answers, and and I think you know that's the trouble is that we d we are expected to have all the answers. I get a lot of questions about like, um, what do you do for you know, and I an insert name of really rare condition that I haven't heard of. It's like, well, I don't know, um, and I go back to the. The thing I always say when I'm teaching um, um, to all the um, to my bow and light is look, whatever the condition is, that's not the problem. So whatever the condition is, that's not the problem. The condition um, is is what somebody has the name of the thing that they have. So so the answer the question is always, oh, what do I do with somebody that's got X, Y, or Z? And my answer is always, well, what's the problem? It may be, well, they've got you know lung cancer or they've got drop foot. Well, it's, that, that's, that's not the problem. The problem might be, well, they don't sleep very well or they um, can't walk further than 100 yards. So these are the problems that we have rather than necessarily the conditions. I'm not interested in treating conditions or, or even necessarily um, getting into the, the, the deep detail of conditions. What I'm interested in is finding out about who the person is and what, what problems they are experiencing um, in relation to whatever conditions they might have, and they might have two or three of them. You know, what is it they want to be able to do that they can't currently do? They might just want to sleep better. Um, and that then eliminates all those aspects as far as that condition is concerned. Now, obviously, there's certain things you need to be aware of in terms of, you know, red flags and what have you, but, but that's more sort of a, a box-ticking exercise. Um, and um, um, it, it's hard to then um, um, move forward from that. That's, that's the issue that we have. Um, so somebody sort of said the um, deciding what tissue layer is most relevant to support a patient at this moment uh, generally default to bone because that was my training. Um, they are um, easy, there may be easier ways. Um, and I think this goes back to, you know, you, if you think that you are focusing on a tissue layer, well the only tissue layer that you're really focusing on is the skin and the superficial fascia that lies underneath it. That's, that's all you can touch. You can't touch anything else except unless you've got a sharp knife. And generally speaking, um, people take a dim view of that as a therapeutic tool. So uh, don't do that one. So the only interface that you have is skin and superficial fascia, the skin and the adipose. So anything else is a reflection of that. Now as you drop through those layers, you are going with the tissues that hold those in place. So if you want to touch bone, then all the fibers that come from the bone and go to the bone and go above the bone and below the bone and around the bone are also involved in this process of touch and movement. The same, the same thing goes. Um, you, know, you cannot isolate an individual muscle and move that or work it or contract it or do anything else. It is just not possible. But that's the trouble with anatomy because we look in a book and we go, this is a muscle, this is the nerve of action, this is the origin, this is the insertion. 
that's the muscle I'm touching, I'm working on. And from there we end up with all kinds of problems like, you know, syndromes, piriformis syndrome and, um, um, you know, iliotibial band syndrome around structures that, that don't exist, like the iliotibial band, and, and muscles that you can't touch, like the piriformis. And, you know, what a well, if I said to somebody, well, how do you know it's, it's not obturator externus or gamelli superior syndrome? And I'm like, well, I've never heard of those. Ah, precisely. So you can only have a syndrome <laughs> with a bit of tissue that you've got a name for. Do you see what I mean? It's like, well, if you didn't know the name of that thing, you wouldn't be able to give it a syndrome. And, and it's just not particularly likely that the thing you think is giving you the syndrome is the thing that is giving you the syndrome. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a conundrum. Uh, Jenny says, I have asked about the links that you see between pelvic damage and dropped foot. Well, again, define pelvic damage. Um, it's it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky one. Um, the, the 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 pelvis is is, is you know I think somebody mentioned uh, I think Tom Tom Myers was saying that the it, you know the pelvis could be considered to be the upper leg, and and yes, in as much as if, if we look at the 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 structure that we just mentioned, which was the um, obturator internus. I'm just going to go and get my my skelly over here. And uh, so. So here's our here's our uh, here's our skelly and um, okay. um, and if if we think about let me just move this um, if we think about the um, the obturator internus as a, as a as a good example so this is the obturator foramen so obturator um, means um, obturator foramen means closed opening I've got to keep an eye on uh, what else is going on in here as well in case anybody's probably obturator means closed opening so foramen means opening and obturating obtuse or what have you means it's closed so you have this this obturator foramen this is a, a, a structure which is um, there to absorb if you imagine falling on your ass on, on, on that on that, that sit bone then your pelvis would shatter particularly if you get to a certain age and so we have to have um, the foramen that's going to disperse that load and, and, and uh, that, that crunk, crunch but of course, you can't have big holes through the pelvis, and so you have the obturator internus and the obturator externus. Now, the obturator internus, and it's a trick question that comes up um, in anatomy exams, the obturator internus is a, is a structure that comes off the trochanter of the femur here, and it wraps itself around the inside, and it spreads out, and it covers the inside of this, uh, of this pelvis. But of course, it's, it, so it wraps itself around, and it's a less, like a sliding surface um, and um, it slides underneath the structures that are going to be uh, the sacrospinous and um, sacrospinous and sacrotubus lumens. So the sacrospinous uh, fossa and super, uh, the um, greater and lesser sciatic notch and so on, so on so on and so forth. But these are, are formed by connective tissue. So the obturator comes around. It's held in place and supported by a couple of fellows called Gamelli, um, and that's coming from the top of the um, of the femur, the tr head of the, the femur, the, not the head of the femur, but the trochanter of the femur. So any time we get rotation, uh, internal, external rotation, or lateral medial rotation, then we've got the obturator, and it's really strongly pinned in there. If anybody's ever seen one in my videos that relate to it, it's massively strong. It's probably one of the strongest muscles in the pelvis. I, I can't imagine anything that's going to be more strong or fibrous in that pelvis other than the obturator internus. It's very deep, and it's very hard to, uh, to see on imaging and stuff like that. And so it's not really sure what's going on with it, but there's a there's a, a, a certain range that this is so slidey in here and so smooth this bone when you look at it in dissection that something has to be going on that we're probably not um, uh, describing or explaining. Um, if we go further down and I go, thanks Brenda, nice bag, um, and uh, I think it's from uh, from Tiger. It had some oil leaked into it, so it smells lovely as well. Um, if we go further down, we've got another structure which is very similar, um, and another, the other structure, would you mind lifting your leg up, thank you so much. The other structure, I'm very polite to my skeleton when I'm not abusing it. The other structure that, <laughs> I love that sort of knee rising up into the shot. The other structure that we got here um, is a structure that is, that is um, a combination of three. And it's, it's not really very talked about, but I, I'm going to be writing about more about this in the future and doing a bit of study on it, which is a structure called a pes and serinus. Um, and uh, there is a prize um, of anybody that can put in the, um, 
without looking it up mind you can't go on Google what Pez Anserinus means and we'll come back to that but Pez Anserinus um, and uh, it's a very disappointing prize anyway so because it isn't really a prize apart from me saying well done but what Pez Anserinus means but Pez Anserinus is a combination of three structures so the Pez Anserinus um, is really interesting when you look at it but the thing about anatomy is that a little bit like um, like like cookery everything's with cookery with me isn't it if you have an ingredient, you, have, you understand here is an egg and we can boil an egg and fry an egg and scramble an egg and what have you. And then here is some flour and we can mix flour into, uh, with water and it becomes a, a, a paste and it becomes glue and um, you know, we can make sourdough with it in, in, the right, in the right manner when things are done to it. Goose's foot, well done Terence. A goose foot, Pez and Serinus. And Sir is the, um, is the um, um, genus of the goose. And Pez means foot. So uh, we understand that you have individual ingredients and you have the role of those individual ingredients. But, and the same thing goes in anatomy. We said pears and serinus. <laughs> yeah, pears and serinus. Hmm. Just got to work out what serinus might be, Brenda. I think that's, let's, let's go that, pear, that serinus is some kind of um, nutmeg liqueur. That would do. Pears and serinus, just drink that and eat pears. That sounds good to me. Um, so, so again, the, 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 the idea is um, that we have a muscle and the muscle is assigned a role and a nerve of action and that it you know, flexes the leg or rotates the knee or whatever else it happens to be done. But what we don't do, and we, don't, and we do it badly, and it goes back to my original point, if you missed the beginning of this, then, then look at the recording, we don't consider the combination of things and what might happen when those things are under um, contraction or pressure or, or movement or load. Um, and um, so therefore, when we look at Oh, hang on. I, there was a, I had, you said goods for, I'm sorry Trevor, goods, goods is not a, um, is not the correct um, answer, so bad luck. Uh, but Terence underneath you got goose foot, so you said goods for. Less, uh, a little bit more attention to your keyboard and you might have won the prize, but it is going to Terence. And your prize, Terence, is a, a, a bag that smells of aromatherapy or, actually I'm not letting you have that, I quite like that bag. Uh, get your own. But well done. Good for. Um, um, Linus. Oh, God. Linus Johansson in Sweden is being all clever in the chat box here. He says, Would you like to elaborate on proprioception and the different properties um, it seems to have in different layers and areas, according to Carlos Deco, and how proprioception are also important in advanced technique? No. I'll come. I'll come back to that, and and I and I've I've, I've read what Carlos Carla says, and um and again, you know, um, it presupposes there are layers. Uh, and and uh, yeah. Anyway, so pes anserinus is a really good example. So pes anserinus is a structure that's coming off uh, the three three muscles that make up pes anserinus. So gracilis, um, which is coming off the inside of the uh, of uh, the um, uh, pelvis, uh, the sartorius coming off the asis and the semitendinosus. So you've got these three structures that are coming, forming a sort of a, uh, uh, you know, a sort of a, a, a tripod from pubis, ASIS, all coming off the pelvis, and then blending themselves down around the pes anserinus in this sort of at medial side of the tibia. Now when you follow that fascia down, it becomes part of this whole fascia of the leg, the crural fascia that blends itself across the, the tibialis anterior, wraps itself around the uh, the interosseous, you know, becomes the interosseous membranes and so on and so forth. And they're not separate. You can't separate them out at this, at this point in time. I mean, you could, but you'd be cheating effectively to do it. And that's what a lot of anatomy does. And that's what a lot of fascial study does. It goes, well, here's a fascia. Let's separate this out and pretend it's something separate. Well, it's not. It can't be. You know, it doesn't, doesn't work like that. Um, and proprioception can't work from an individual layer. It's just physiologically not possible for that to happen. Um, now, you're going to get different properties of proprioception. You're going to get different um, understanding of, of, you know, in much the same way that you've got uh, mechanotransductors. And mechanotransductors are going to have different, uh, the, 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 the um, mechanoreceptors, rather, are going to have the different um, things in different parts of the body that pick up on pressure and vibration, and some of them are adapting fast and some of them are adapting slowly. Um, but they're going to be different in different areas. And you can map them to a certain extent, but they also have qu 
quite a good degree of plasticity, so they'll quite they'll move and they'll change and they'll adapt quite quickly. Um, the definition of a, a mechanoreceptor is that it has its own little bit of capsule, and um, that you can um, you know that it has its own little connective tissue capsule. The nerve endings that don't have their own bit of um, capsule, little encapsulated nerve endings, are, are the free nerve endings, and so you'll find those on the feet because you know every time you move around, you need to have lots of information that's going on. So the, the, the receptors are always, are always going to be bringing you a sense of where you are and what you're doing and what is touching you, and that's going to feed into your proprioception as well, your sense of awareness of where you are in the body. And of course, different bits of the body are going to have different bits of uh, awareness. Um, as to whether the different um, the, uh, the layers it has in different areas, um, again, you would have to say that those layers are, um, if, 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 if anything is going to have proprioception, it's going to be epithelium, because there aren't any layers except the epithelium that connects them. Ha, go figure on that, lean as Swedish, clever, New Hampshire. I can't tell you what my teacher would say, but it goes like this. But yeah, this is the thing, is that, is that once we try and narrow things down, and this is a tendency, is, is that, you know, even within Carla's work, and Carla is a genius, let's face it, that, that, that you know, she's as clever as a clever person who's got the clever gene, um, then, you know, you still have to reduce and narrow something down, and you have to um, take it down to a position of theoretical science rather than necessarily applying it from a, a perspective of um, broad-based human understanding, and, 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 th and that's the issue that we have. Um, and certainly when we start to look at bits of, tish bits of tissue, you know, like um, shear loading, there's a video I've got on YouTube about shear loading. Well, the way that we come up with an understanding of what, sh what shear loading is, is we take bits of spine out of cadavers and we force them and load them and find out what breaks. Well, generally speaking, you know, bits of spine don't wander around up and down the street. You know, they generally have a whole bunch of muscles above them and below them and around them. And so, you know, this is the problem that we have is a huge amount of research and a huge amount of, uh, uh, of approaches and treatments w within complementary and um, allopathic medicine is based around the study of, a, of, of, of bits of tissue that um, are, are, are taken out from dead people and then assumed to have some kind of property. And, and, I, and I struggle with that a little bit, um, even though my work is, is you know, the, the big part of my work and the part that I love is, is doing dissection. I'm not trying to impute meaning um, into tissues that are, you know, essentially dead. So the combination of something like pes and serinus and its, and its ongoing um, load through where is the knee? Where is the knee in relation to the pelvis? So if we wanted to discuss proprioception, we'd have to say that those three, the join up of those three tissues, at the very least, are going to contribute to an understanding of where this medial side of the tibia is in relation to three aspects of the, of, the, um, of the pelvis. You know, if you've got three strings on a kite, they're all doing different work as far as the load is concerned. Similarly, you're going to have a transfer of load and, and information coming from the foot. So the position of the foot is going to directly load into the rest of the pelvis. You can extend that by going, well, all right, here's um, another favorite muscle of mine, which is acting like another little pulley or lever, which is um, fibularis. So fibularis is coming off the fibula. Um, as most of the, you know, these long structures of the foot and the toe are all long. I mean, you know, hallux is long as a big toe um, uh, is, is longest because it's coming right up onto the, almost up into the knee. But fibularis is blending itself all the way down, all the way down, um, and longus goes all the way across onto the other side of the foot. So that's, that's, the, that's the attachment of fibularis from here all the way to there. That's longus, and brevis stops here. You know, so are we now going to not say that the position of the foot here is related to the torsion or tension that comes through fibularis, wraps itself around the knee, and then blends into those three structures of the, uh, of the pelvis? I could probably prove it. Um, does it mean it's there? No, I could probably prove it individually or enough times to say that it's, it's probable, but it's that logical anyway that, you know, take it as read, that, 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 that a, lo a rotated knee loaded onto the lateral side of the foot is going to have to adjust the pelvis. How one that does, how one does that, um, is going to be through a central nervous system adjustment, which is a feedback mechanism from the brain. So. Is, is it in different layers? Um, um, it, it's going to come from different parts and different structures. 
I, I don't like to use the word layers. And I think, the, I think we have to eliminate the word layers from our, from our vocabulary uh, because I think that th this is the question that we've had um, so, many, so much of, is like which layer am I affecting, which layer am I treating, which layer am I working on. Um, and, and the dissection process, you know, certainly that I learned from word go about skin, superficial fascia, deep fascia, and so on so and so forth, has been massively unhelpful in relation to perpetuating that idea of, of, of layers. You know, does, does that make sense? And, and uh, so I think we have to come up with a, a, a different understanding. Um, and it stems from anatomy, and, and anatomy, you know, is fine for teaching undergraduate medical students how, you know, the name of the body and how it hangs together, but it's it's a terrible model to teach our movement therapists, and a terrible model to teach our, uh, our manual therapists. It's, it's, it, because it, it stems for so much confusion, because people are going, what am I working on? I'm seeing all this stuff move. What, what am I working on? If you have medical specialties, and 45 of them, that's fine, you know, because you're a gastroenterologist, so all you're ever going to look at is your guts, and that's fine. So just study the guts. We don't need you to understand, you know, how your eyelashes work. And, and uh, you know, if you are a... You're a cardiologist, you're going to study the heart, and and you know you don't need to know how the lower back works, and that's absolutely fine. I don't have a problem with it. I do, but I'm lying. But never mind. Uh, but if we are uh, if we are the, the movement people like Linus or, or or all you guys watching, then we have to have a different system. We have to come at it differently, and we have to come at it from the perspective of what is joining us together and now what are the different names that's going on and how are we um, interrelating to those and that's where that that TUI idea of mine TO uh, UI comes in that we can start to think you know that things are traveling if you think the, the, the term origin and insertion get rid of those and talk about referencing you know where does something reference come to and from you know where's it on its way to what's it going to join up with what's it going to work with you know muscle can't a attach to bone because it would just rip off if it did um, different types of fascia giving different types of proprioception. Well, yeah, that makes sense. The liver is going to give you a different type of proprioception than the kidney. You have different organs doing different things. You have different fascias. There isn't a thing called fascia. Fascia is not a thing. It doesn't exist. Um, you know, you've got different ten tensions of dense irregular connective tissue mixed with adipose, mixed with, uh, you know, loose areolar connective tissue, mixed with skin and some blood going through it. They're all connective tissues. And they're all going to have different jobs, and depending on where they are in the body. So, you know, well, that's a no-brainer. You know, proprioception is going to be different according to where you are in the body, and that where you are in the body is going to have a different need. You know, you don't see the deep layers of fascia in the upper body to the same extent as you do in the lower limb because you don't need that stability in the upper body that you do in the lower limb. You don't have these big thick sheets of of, of fascia around the leg and around the lower back, and um, because you need more mobility, you need more movement. And so therefore, they will be different, different kinds of, of fibres. The epimesial and paramesial will be stronger or weaker or softer. Um, and so therefore, the proprioception will be different because the ground substances and the fibres that hold it will be different. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's the house that you live in in, in in Sweden in the winter is going to be different than the house that you live in um, in, in Papua New Guinea all the year round. It's, it's, it's a no-brainer. Different, different organs do different things and different fascias do different things. And... The two have a a, 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 um, a meet up of the of together. Um, so uh, does that make sense? Is that is that is that okay? Yeah, I, I would I would go with that. But the, but layers is a, is a word. Like I said, it's 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 a thing we have to get get rid of. So uh, thanks for misrepresenting Carlos Seco, Linus. That's see me later. Um, I'm you know I'm making a list. I'm checking it twice. I'm going to find out. Who's naughty or nice? Um, where are we now? What other questions have we got? Stick any questions you've got in there, please. Um, uh, proprioception contra movement. So, um, so oh yeah, please listen. Uh, there's a catch. There's always a catch. No such thing as free lunch. Sign up. My um, my uh, my my new workshop um, that's coming up is is going to be basically talking about this. You know, different fascias, different organs. It's going to explain to you the science behind um, fascia. It's going to show you, right, here is, you know, this is it, dense irregular, and I've kept it, you know, as short and simple as is possible, um, and explain the, 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 the detail of it, but that's really what I want to get across. It was a talk I gave a few years ago, which was some um, WTF, the, what, what the fascia were originally, um, and then um, Gil went on and gave a what's this fascia tour, which was kind of cool. Um, 
And um, so, um, but it was a talk I gave a few years ago at the British Fascist Symposium. I've sort of condensed it a little bit. So um, please have a little look um, and just um, have a little look at the, um, the link I've just popped up on there. Um, so uh, Linus in his um, um, poor English here, sorry, Linus, uh, proprioception contra movement, as against movement, touches therapy and proprioception contra movement. Um, I don't really understand that question, so um, um, perspective on touch. Um, I'll come back to that when you've got a, um, when, can you clarify your question a little bit for me, Linus, please, thank you. Um, the, the, um, the impact of the nervous system and circulatory system of soft tissues and trauma, in, in particular around the neck and shoulder and lower back. Um, and I've got a couple of arm questions that um, uh, need to be looked at as well. But um, I, I, think, I think when we come to the idea of touch and, and we have all these different therapies and different approaches and, and you know, one, is, one is deep, one is soft and one is light, but I think the key here is, is touch, that we, we're touching and we are rubbing it and, and poking it and sliding it and doing whatever it is we're doing. But it's the touch that's really, really key. And, and we crave touch as, as humans. It's a massively, massively important part. Um, to our development, to our growth factors, to the chemicals, the, the TGFs that the, are produced by the pituitary are produced in relation to touch. Now, I would suggest, based on my research and understanding, that the lighter touch is more likely to drive those growth factors and drive repair based upon what our, our sort of primal level is rather than deep tissue. But that's, that remains to be seen. That's my feeling, um, and that's, again, a personal personal view. Are we actually doing something physiologically, mechanically, or what have you? And, I, and, I, and I'm posting this this week exactly, like what is it we think we're doing? Um, and the answer is we really, really don't know. And this is the struggle that we've had for, um, for, for many, many years within the manual therapy perspective that you know, we do something and something changes and people you know, get off. And then we wanted to give it names and we've called it, you know, release this and change that. And, and we're not probably releasing anything or, or changing anything at all in a session, we're touching somebody. So touch is powerful because it communicates you know, up to a, a central, through a central nervous system and out from a central nervous system. Um, and um, if I'm walking around with my shoulders up in the, up in the air and I come along and, and somebody puts their hand on me, I change that movement because I've got now a touch that says, this is what you're doing, this is the awareness of it, and you change the awareness of it by changing the output from your central nervous system into that group. You change the way that you do it. What drives us to do that? Um, injury, compensation, fear of falling is a big one. Um, if you've ever fallen over in public, um, you know, and you haven't been drunk, obviously, but you've fallen over in public and it's humiliating. It's really deeply humiliating. And the reason for that is that it's probably more so than is warranted given, you know, you just fell over, nobody cares, we all do it but you feel oh, so humiliating. And the reason being is this, is because from a biological evolution perspective, you fall over, you're gonna die. You know, something is gonna eat you or kill you or somebody, or, or, or you're gonna get trampled. That's it, you are, you are over, it's game over. So the last thing that we wanna do is fall over. So we, we bring in levels of stability, irrespective of how harmful they might be. We lean forward and we, we compensate for these things, and so the fear of falling is a, is, 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 is a big one. So this is how we get into those positions. Posture, habit, sitting down, not doing the movement that we might do. It's, we're training for that constantly on a constant basis. So we get into these positions, tension, stress, loading, blah, 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 you name it, and suddenly we're, we're doing it all the time. We've learned how to do it, and our connective tissues have laid down those tissues to facilitate that. Um, somebody comes along and says, stop doing that, gives us the instruction, they might have to do it several times, and we stop doing it, and we don't have the same problems anymore. Um, is it as simple as that? I don't know, maybe. We, we haven't got any, any other better explanation. Um, we can't change fascia with our hands, we can't stretch muscle, make it longer. Um, you know, we, we don't have, if you, if you stretch muscle and made it longer, then you'd have to be eight foot tall, if you were a bendy person, well, you're not. So, you know, why, why can we bend forward? Um, we don't know why, what the, what the mechanism of stretching is, believe it or not. We don't know what the mechanism of lots of things are. Breathing, we don't know why we breathe, don't know why we sleep. Um, these are all things, you know, we, we have no idea about. Um, so we, we, th these are, these are things we're not sure about. Um, but it's, it's one of those things that, um, 
when you touch somebody, you communicate on a, on a, on a level that is, oh, all right, okay, we can understand how they're moving, how they're holding, how they're standing, how they're sitting, and we can transmit that information back to them, and we can help them to move. And I think the combinations are, um, I, I would say, you know, if, if it's movement versus touch, I don't think there's a separation between the two. I think that where we can't move, we introduce touch as a way of helping that area to start to move. We introduce and touch and movement type touch to get tissues to be more hydrated as in movement flowing, flowing through them um, and therefore we end up with a, a better range of movement. The two are not mutually exclusive, you know, that it's not an either or. Um, but, you know, if somebody's coming out of, a, uh, of, a, of a, an injury or rehab or surgery or a long period of time where they are unwell or in pain, um, they're not going to have that level of movement so we need to start to introduce touch to them to help them to move to help them to feel confident to reduce their pain and, and i'm going to say that most of my job as a therapist is is telling people that they're not as bad as they think they are you know it's like i was saying to a child i'll oh, get up you know stop loving pick your leg up and bring it over here you know it, it's it's um it, it's it's saying to clients it's okay you know you, you you've had a laminectomy you don't have a bone rubbing on a bone you know, it's not as bad as you think. It's the fear of pain that you have, and you're going to be okay. That's half the um, half the, um, the, the 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 battle, if we like, and that's really uh, what we're going to get to people to do. But ultimately, my goal for everybody is to get them moving. You know, we want movement. We understand that um, movement is the key to successful human function, and without it, we are screwed. You know, and and we don't move. We know we don't move enough. We know that sometimes we move in the wrong in the wrong ways in the wrong places, um, and um, uh, you know we, we just got to do it better. And if a, if there's a hands-on therapist um, therapy that helps to reduce pain, increase confidence, and therefore ultimately um, improves range of movement, then that's really the the, the ultimate goal. I'm going to move on because I want to stop very shortly. Um, I've got a Natalie's just come just arrived here now. Welcome to the party, Natalie. Um, <laughs> it's glad you found it. But better late than not at all. Uh, let me just have a quick look at this underbite um, surgeon is going to break bones in his face. Oh my word! This is this is dreadful. Um, he used to chew gum all the time, stretch the jaw. Um, hang on, where are we? Um, so where are we gone here now? Um, and uh, he used to stretch the jaw. He doesn't. Does he just need strength? Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I, the, the thing the thing about the jaw, the, the dissection I did this year. Um, and last year actually in the jaw was just phenomenal the the level from temporalis the overlaps of temporalis that you, you've got going down into the masseter and down into the uh, the deep structure of the face um, are, are just phenomenal the thing to remember about about the jaw is that it's you know it's a horseshoe shaped bone that's going all the way around so these joints this this is the joint of, of one end and this is the joint of the other end so you move one and you move the other with it you know the two don't separate themselves out so even the slightest amount of movement that you have downwards and forwards, and remember that this here, this joint here, has a lot more loading um, than if you bit on your finger. Um, and there's a capsule in it. So any kind of lateral movement or even forward movement is putting enormous amounts of pressure that are going to push them throw itself through the jaw and also onto the back of the head. Do not forget the back of the head. Because this sternocleidomastoid and the overlap that's going through things like digastric onto the back of the head and, and uh, splenius cavitus, these are all these things that are holding it in place, so you've got to go to the back of the neck first um, and have a little look at that. Um, I don't know why. I'm seeing actually uh, on uh, this weekend, I'm seeing a, um, um, a Megzello facial dentist guy, so we'll have a little look at this um, and um, the underbite. Uh, you know what? I, the, the thing about surgery, and don't get me wrong, I have no problem with surgery, is that is that if you if you go to a surgeon, the surgeon says you need surgery, and people are surprised. It's like, well, what do you think he was going to do? Offer you a stroke and a, you know, a, a packet of chips it's like well you know that's his job but it's what he does he's not going to offer you reiki is he um the you question um feeling they say aches and pains when the weather is damp and changing is this about the way to feel more more comfortable or more movement um yeah i mean again it's a question of, of of obviously damp weather does affect people and their their joints and their and their bones and uh you know the the old rheumatics and damp cold weather you know gets into people if they're getting cold and chilled so um more movement more movement in um in in areas where you know that they can feel that they're stiff and and, and but also don't forget there's going to be behavior with it you know when it's when it's cold and damp 
Um, what is it? What do you feel like when it's cold and damp outside? So bear that in mind that it's not just the cold and the damp, it's the behavior and the feeling that goes with it and the lack of wanting to, uh, to move around. And uh, another question from Natalie, um, aches and pains, so that's cool. Um, just found a chat part, okay. Um, so thanks Linus, exactly what you're after. I I've actually made Linus happy. <laughs> um, so a TMJ. Uh, yeah, I, it's it's probably um, his hope in my bar. I, do you know, Natalie, with this chat with the jaw, I, without seeing it, it's really hard to say. And, and I'd like to know what else is going on. Are there any breathing breathing issues going on? I think across the neck and the shoulders, position of his head. There's so many uh, factors in there that I would really want to have a little look at uh, before we had surgery. Now, um, they will not have looked at those before surgery. You know, maxillary facial surgeons are notorious for looking at the face and the jaw. That's what I was saying about the anatomy earlier on, that, that, that you know, it, it's, that's the region that you're focused on and never the twain shall meet. So, um, and literally, I, I dissected heads for those groups because that's all they're looking at is the face and the jaw. So the position of that in relation to the head, the shoulders, the neck from the front as well, you know, things like all these tissues that come from the sternum and up into the inside of the jaw, these are all factors that you'd want a little look at, particularly if you have got an underbite and overbite. So um, uh, that's really where we are, um, uh, we're looking at. You know, as for, the, as for the fitness of window cleaner, it's all um, secondary to that, but I, I, I can't really um, um, help you in that. Um, yeah, I, I will. I will have a chat to this chap on Saturday and see if we can, um, if I can, um, if, he's, if he's up for a little, a little podcast, uh, Facebook live chat thing. Uh, but really, the, the the thing is this: is that you know, change the position that your jaw is in, um, and you will end up with um, the, the, a different loading from your head, your neck, your shoulders. Your breath will change. Your hips will change. Your pelvis will change. That's not me being a weird out there alternative complementary therapist. That's the basic physics. Um, of load head poundage um, and that's the laws of physics I didn't make it up um, you know it's the equal and opposite reaction so I am going to knock it on the head I I know I started a little bit late but I'm sliding out early so um, oh, oh now you've got questions coming in oh, oh look here we go uh, any insight to psoas restrictions and back pain and hip pain no forget the psoas it's not the psoas forget the psoas um, Stop it with the psoas. There is so much else. And right underneath your fingers, there are six to 10 layers of structure when you press on a psoas and abdomen, right? You know, it's all right in here that will affect rotation, load, uh, and they're called the abdomen. You don't need to go to this dullish muscle, this dull art of a muscle called the psoas, which is just there to give you stability. And uh, we are, you know, we, we, are, we have to think, what are we actually close to and touching, rather than actually the, the, the pink bit of tissue that you've seen in a book and that somebody has said it's the seat of your emotions. It's ridiculous, stop it, okay? Um, size restrictions, but so, um, there we go. Uh, where are we? Um, orthotics completely adjust the patella and other connecting joints to the extent of excruciating pain in the knee. Can orthotics completely adjust? Yes. Go and stand, go and stand on, a, on, a, on a hillside for half an hour and lean into it. Tell me how you feel through your legs. Well, that's what orthotics doing. I mean, don't, don't put orthotics in unless you really, really are 100% sure that there is something that is not going to be changed by soft tissue work. And again, you know, people make their living on these things and the orthotic person is not going to assess your shoulders or your head. You push your head forward, you load your feet differently. It's a no-brainer. It's physics. It's not anatomy. Just ignores the physics. It's very convenient. You know, it conveniently goes. We don't talk about that to the point that it denies that relationship of five or six kilos of head. You know, moving around on top of a pole. Well, sit on a horse. The horse will move if you move your head. Sit on a pair of skis or a bike or a scooter or or, or one uh, one roller skate and move your head. And um, as you're going very very fast, and it will change as well. Linus has stolen a quote of mine, he says, and he says, we are not just dissecting bodies, we are dissecting our knowledge, our, dis our dissecting our language and our beliefs. Absolutely, thank you for pointing that out. We we've got to change the way we think. It's not enough to dissect a body or learn anatomy, we've got to understand how the human moves. And there is no point of delivery, there's nowhere in the Western world where at the point of healthcare delivery, prior to surgery or post-surgery, where somebody is going to come in and look at you and go, ah, oh, your head is here, your shoulders are here, this is how you're holding, we're going to teach you some postural change, or we're going to show you how to move better so that you can recover better. Nobody is doing that, and it's mental, it's bonkers. 
um, and it's cheap and it's easy and uh, we should be doing it and we should have been doing it 50 years ago. Um, and um, that's it. I think I'll stop there because otherwise I'll just start ranting. I will do this again. Um, if there are any questions you've got coming in, please, um, please, if you would um, do me the honour of, uh, of um, signing up for my, uh, what's it here? I'm just going to put this again here um, for my uh, workshops coming up. I'm just going to push this in here again, so um, uh, so we can copy that as well. There we go. So I'm going to pop this in the in the chat box down in here. So please register for my um, for my workshops that are coming up. The uh, the pain well, I think we do the pain workshop now, but I've got a, a sort of three uh, working um, good um, practical you know fascial theory and practical approaches um, and and the reality of it rather than actually some of the stuff that we talk about. So uh, please sign up for those. They're all free. They're coming out very very soon. And um, I, uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. In the meantime, uh, stick with some messages up in here. Please uh, spread the word. This video uh, will be up later on. And um, I will uh, see you again uh, sometime. And um, it's cheap and it's easy. That's why they don't do it. Ah, don't go down that route. Murray, do not go down that route. It's not Big Pharma. It's got nothing to do with Big Pharma. It's to do with much to do with us and how lazy we are and how entrenched we are in our beliefs and our uh, un 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 anatomical um, perspectives as it has to do with anybody else. We've just got to get this side and this side together and, and knock some heads together and that's where, uh, that's where I come in. So thanks guys, I'm gonna uh, over and out, so I'm gonna end this. Um, it's gonna get posted up and uh, so you can uh, scroll through my rantings and uh, see me um, uh, having a go at my uh, one arm. What time's your arm? I can't leave you alone for a minute, can I? Crazy. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining me from all over the world. It's been absolutely um, a pleasure and a privilege. I need to do this more often. And until somebody sort of pushes me, I tend not to. So please send me your questions. I love getting your questions. I love getting your feedback. Um, it's been a lonely couple of years sitting in front of the video camera. And uh, so um, I love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of the evening. And I will see you all very soon. Bye for now.